Atlanta Rain is one of the first expansion teams that have given us a structure that could be a fully fledged expansion team, considering they have the minimum amount of players, which is eight, and they have also full coaching staff by the looks of it. So it's quite likely that the product we currently see and that is announced will be the final product what, with what the team will be starting into the Overwatch League with next season, season two. They've set on a path of high risk with potentially medium to high reward. The historic quality of their pickups range from very likely upper quartile to almost lottery tickets. So let's start, as always, with the guy that actually assessed the team itself. And of course, among the, the management team, it is predominantly, or at least that is how it is communicated to us, uh, Sefi, or probably more well-known as former selfless and shock coach Brad. And his track record so far in competitive Overwatch has been so-so, but it's certainly interesting that he has this much uh, history. He had, in the building of both selfless and the shock he also had pretty much a structure that we see here he had some high reward picks that worked out in the case for instance of sinatra in the instance of um the player that he then picked up now later on but back in the day on selfless the friend uh on on shock it was probably navix was uh underrated on the position that he ended up playing and overall the bare bones of shock other than the players dark nomi and iddqd who pretty much one has to say looked like blanks in the sense that all three of them won't be seen in overwatch league season two which sort of speaks to their quality this could give us an example and i think there are some of those picks in there that have a relatively high chance to follow the th same path that these three players that Brad has formerly recruited are also going to take. So this is something to keep in mind and should raise some skepticism towards that at the same time. Um, of course, don't discredit what he has done for talent development. Simply based on data, his uh, performance just in head to head was slightly better than the record Krusty had. Now, of course, there was a new meta coming in and Krusty going in as a new head coach. Um, had to sort of restructure, also put in new uh, teammates into that uh, entire thing with Choi Yobin coming in. Architect probably wasn't as settled in at this time. So it wasn't as comparable to Aero's situation, for instance, in Dallas, as one might think. Though at the same time, their performance overall was actually quite comparable even though one thinks, oh yeah, Dallas had a great stage four because they made it to playoffs. Well, Shock almost did. So it wasn't too terribly different, even though that's a notable distinction, of course. So as I said, the decent track record in uh, player development. And one thing that also is true for Brad is that he seems to be loyal to his players and that he likes to give second chances or likes to bring people along that he's worked with in the past, that can have both advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantage we already mentioned, um, as in some of these players looked like they are not now not Overwatch League potentially, even though the three that have gone out aren't necessarily, you know, former teammates of this, or, or but it's it's more like it seemed to be that there was some personal connection that made him so. That's obviously my assumption. It might very well be that they were uh, dictated pickups by uh, management, for instance. One thing that one can get a size about is that Brad's teams usually play some very exciting Overwatch. Quite aggressive, especially in Selfless case, and they had a unique style. I remember that they had very particular concepts that they always like to go after. I remember in season one, they they valued high ground so highly, much more highly than other teams. Um, and 
Yeah, but we're probably right on some of those positions. I think, for instance, Anubis, they probably were the first ones to really figure that out, even though my memory might betray me here. The rest of the coaching staff really doesn't have big accolades. So some of them are former LNL players, uh, sorry, coaching staff. And one has to say the track record of LNL is also something one has to be conscious of, but because it's not like they actually won contenders, what they did was they uh, performed above expectations, but with a pretty sizable coaching staff. And I also don't like the argument that simply because they weren't paid, that they were therefore, you know, sort of uh, disabled in their ability to perform 100%. Most of their staff is very young, likely still living with parents at the, that time LNL played. So I don't think anyone had really had to work full time while coaching that team. So keep that in mind. Uh, still a respectable uh, outcome with LNL. And one thing for sure, they managed to get a lot of their entire structure there into the Overwatch League. So kudos for that. Now let's get into the team. I personally think the crown jewel of this team is Erster. Former mighty AOD players, like so many other great players uh, in the Overwatch League, and that is a topic in itself for another time, then went to Ardient, and then famously went to Lucky Future Zenith, a Korean team that dominated uh, Chinese contenders for two seasons, won them both, and Erster was the star player of that team. He has the, a great range of projectile heroes, sp especially known for his Genji, but he's also very serviceable. Junkrat played some Farah, Doomfist also pretty nuts. So uh, if projectiles are part of the hero pool, I don't think Atlanta Rain has to be particularly, you know, afraid of any of those things phasing them out of the meta. Double hit scan, now we're talking about problems. Famously also, or rather recently, Volomo, the uh, analyst for the English broadcast of Chinese contenders, also said on a broadcast that he thought Erste had the potential to be the carpe of season two. Now, granted, Volomo made that uh, statement on a talk show where, you know, the objective is to make bold statements, but I don't think he was uh, particularly, you know, untruthful in his assessment. One reason he wasn't highly sought, sought after is probably or presumably because of interpersonal tensions he had in other teams and some of the Korean teams actually didn't even consider him for that reason. His English reportedly is not amazing, but there's still a lot of time and I hope they use the time they have now to, to get it to a, an acceptable level. Overall, Erste potential talent that could surprise very much like a striker did. And I think it's realistic to, if the meta allows for it, to have one of those stages where, for instance, Genji or Junkrat are dominant, and then I think we will see him have striker as performances, not because of the heroes, but because he was like a shining beacon that was sort of undervalued at the time. Going up next, and I want to sell this one as a package deal. Of course, it's Daco and Pogpo, both formerly of Element Mystic. And though that is one of the greatest front lines uh, out of Contenders Korea. Um, certainly not the greatest, though. That would probably go to uh, Runaway's front line of Bumper and Janu, of course. The one thing one has to say is that Daco probably has to be considered the 1A and 1B to Janu in terms of 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 tank performance because Daku was has been also pretty insane for a while and was the backbone of a team that was often very innovative and also had potential to actually win uh, Contenders Korea but always fell short for some reason. Now also them both being there, keep that in mind. That might be an element uh, that becomes relevant down the season. Pogpo the, himself, um, probably one of the best racers in the game, 
slotted in seamlessly after Fearless left towards Shanghai Dragons. One thought, okay, Fearless is a pretty good tank. What happens to Element Mystic now? I didn't didn't feel like they lost any speed by bringing Pogpo in. It was actually quite impressive how quickly he was able to keep up once again. And in that regard, I think not many people are too high on Pogpo. I think he's a very solid tank. It's quite unlikely that he will be a, a below average tank on pretty much all his picks. Though at the same time, I'm not sure he, if he will be a world class tank. So also keep that in mind. For Daco, he also could be one of the top performers in Overwatch League. Next player, and now we're leaving the realm of the South Korean players, interestingly, because this is a hybrid team. So, in comes Kodak, formerly 123, Mosaic Esports, and Six Snakes, all these, these European teams with extremely high potential, right? So, especially 123 was... You know, one of those teams that on good days could basically win it against everyone at the time. And then Six Snakes also was busting with European talent. Certainly thinking of asking here. Uh, Kodak himself was one of the outstanding players on that team. He has very good aim. But what's more interesting to me in that regard, also because, yes, he brings a Zen, but now that we probably will have much more flexibility as from the flex support, which might turn into, you know, having to play not just Ana and Zen, but, you know, more picks. And keep in mind, in Overwatch League season is long, there's even a potential that we're getting another flex support that these players have to pick up. I'm pretty confident Kodak could do it. And why I'm confident is I have it on pretty good authority that he has a very solid work ethic. He's one of the guys that comes into the locker room or into the practice room first, um, and is also one that leaves, you know, among the latest. So very solid, sort of calm, collected guy. You don't have to expect any drama from him in that regard. All around a nice person to work with, as I've found out. And I think pretty much everyone that worked with him actually is very happy that he made it into the Overwatch League because he's just a nice kid in that regard. So... If I had to give an assessment here, he is likely to be somewhere between lower, mid, and mid-tier with the potential to go even higher. For instance, performances like Shax comes to mind. Our next one is Masa, one of you know the, the big lineage of solid Gigante players that came into the Overwatch League. And that is also interesting to me that he didn't follow Saita to Paris. It was certainly something to keep in mind. From my research, I asked around and he seems to be very vocal, but he can adapt it in terms of what the team needs. So he isn't over communicating in that regard. He's assertive though, when he needs to be. That is very important for a flex support player, uh, sorry, a main support player that the coach also wants to call. I've talked about this. Not every coach wants it necessarily. I'm pretty sure they want it in Atlanta Rain. He has a wild hero pool. So if two flex supports are asked, that is totally possible for Massa. And it's probably also feasible. Uh, he would probably also slot in as a lower mid-tier support. Could see him as a Kellex that is better at commun communication from the research I was able to do. Next up comes... Melier from an LNL player, and before that he mostly played in Russian slash CIS mixes. But despite that, he has very fluent English, so no problem here. Of course, also played on LNL, as I said. Um, now, the, the one interesting aspect of his is that he is a player that played from Europe, or rather, you know, from Russia to, to the best of my knowledge, to America and then had a ping of 200. So it's very hard to assess his recent performances on LNL and what that might do. Keep in mind, maybe even practicing, you know, on ping and then what happens to him if he gets to land finals because the interesting part about him is he has pretty good aim. He's one of the best aimers uh, in that regard that comes out of the Western region, at least from the ones that are unexplored. So one of the best aimers in the uh, rookie department. 
um, very aggressive. And that is a thing where the game stands and falls with him. He's he's sort of he does doesn't strike me as a cerebral player. Takes a lot of weird one v ones. It's quite instinctual in that regard. That was also echoed to me by um, other coaches slash analysts from that region. And it is hard to therefore see where he could land. Probability likely a lower mid tier DPS. Of course, in the hit scan department now. We're going to Gator. Gator, I don't quite remember when I saw that he was likely going to be a two-way. I'm actually not sure if that's going to be the case. That said, I don't think he will start much over Pogpo, simply because the pogpo Daco synergy should be extremely high. Uh, is sort of like a notorious character. The GOAT's main tank, very solid, aggressive caller. And for a while, his team tore up the tier two scene. And then famously, now everyone calls it goats, played this now dominant comp, at least the you know the vanilla version of it, and gave a lot of people a lot of trouble. And while they probably didn't invent it, or actually absolutely didn't, because I know that Meta Athena was running something similar way back when, but the they are certainly one that popularized it. So here, you know, if that keeps around, certainly something interesting to keep in mind. Aggressive player has been described to me as sort of like the American f Fraggy. And from Fusion, we know that can work for a while. Uh, okay, so sort of projection, hard to say, is probably, you know, also one of the lower mid-tier performers won't matter too much simply because I don't think he will play much. Now the last player is of course the Fran and I don't even want to comment too much on this. I think there's a solid chance that based on his recent behavior that the league will give him a ban for however lo how long because he is a reoccurring um he he, he now threw twice in in uh, non-competitive matches. Now how much the league takes, you know, the surrounding circumstances in mind will certainly be interesting, but he is unlikely to be a starting member anyway, and now it's on an Aaliyah to, you know, cover the hit scan department. What I will say, though, is two things. A, the Fran legitimately is one of the in most insane tracking DPS, or rather aimers, that Overwatch has seen in its history. And that's not an exaggeration. His aim, simply like looking at it, is god tier, right? Now, another thing I will say is that people often bring up, well, what about his hero pool? You know, he was a soldier and tracer player. Well, that is only true if you look at his competitive history, because the I think the same story you could tell, or rather, if you put it in context, what it actually tells me is, the Fran is able to pick up meta characters and play them extremely well. And because Soldier and Tracer were meta when he was, uh, you know, at the at his peak, or rather was playing still with Selfless. So that argument doesn't necessarily work against him. It might just as well be that he is able to pick up other hitscan characters uh, with relative ease. Okay, so let's give an, an overall view of this team and where I think some of the Tripwise could be for them, but also what the potential is and things we probably will need to look out for uh, over the season. So, as an overall projection, I think they're very un or not not very unlikely, but they are unlikely to be the worst team in the league, and unlikely to be a safe playoff team. Now, this is a wide range that that makes them somewhere between uh, seven and eighteen. But uh, I, maybe I want to go a little bit more. I want to hone it in. I think, you know, just about flush in the middle. I would say 10th, 11th, somewhere there is the highest probability where they will end. Uh, one thing that we have to look out for is Nalia probably having to start. And that could turn into a problem, especially if he now isn't able to impose his, you know, aim style onto other players because there are certainly star players in the Overwatch League that 
can't just match his mechanics, probably outmatch him in that regard, and are also smarter players and more calculated players to boot. So he, he will have to improve tremendously and get some depth in the you know cerebral department in order to keep up with these top tier TPS and, and Overwatch League. The English on the team is also a, an interesting part. Now, as I said, Nalia has pretty good English, but is the, the accent, does that work for Koreans? That's also true for Masa. Finnish people always have a pretty strong accent, with the exception of Taimu, who sort of, you know, rounded out over the years of gaming. But most of the time, it's a very distinct accent, and it's it can be hard to listen to for non-native speakers. There's also the fact that they have an interesting mix of personalities. They have the Calm guys, but they also have Gator, they have Erster, and they have Dufran. So that those are intangibles that one has to keep in mind. Then again, uh, that certainly didn't keep other teams from being successful in the Overwatch League last season. If I want to assess, assess the back line, I think the best outcome they can reasonably expect is that they the, that team or that backline, Kodak and Massa, get to the Shaz and Big Goose level. Not likely. Probably are going to perform under them because Shaz and Big Goose was certainly very good let me think. Yeah, I would say they were comp they were tied for the best be Western backline in the Overwatch League. Um, now with uh, Fusion's backline, of course. Then we go to the Element Mystic Curse. Now this these two players, Daco and Pokpo, had some underperformances and also managed to go out fairly early in comp competitions where we thought they were one of the favorites in. So why is that? What is Curses don't exist, but intangibles exist. And if there's a pattern, either it's very unlucky or there's something to it. It doesn't mean it needs to manifest in this team. It is something to keep in mind, though. And then as the last part, the coaching staff... Okay, let's be honest. In comparison to Korean head coach royalty coming in, also you know main, being maintained, these proven head coaches from season one, such as you know the Fusion coaching coaching staff, even I would say Krusty, um, I would say uh, Wizard Young, you know all these guys that are sort of you know seen as you know the stronger coaches in league. Then again, we don't have too many data points to assess this, but simply on their reputation and their results, so their accolades, one has to say this is probably one of the, you know, th this had to be in the lower half of coaching staffs in the Overwatch League. Now, there are a lot of young guys on that coaching staff, so there's probably some potential, but then again, I don't don't even know if young coaching staffs are necessarily a positive factor. There are people on this team. I think they're they're not even eighteen yet, so they're analysts, though. But then again, twenty-one year old coaches. There are very few exceptions, like a demon, for instance, in uh, for Paris now that work. But it can, right? There's assessing these young guys that just came in, where Atlanta Rain is maybe their third or second team. It's very hard to assess what their performance will be like, though certainly to keep in mind. I think as such, I sort of summarized where they could land, how I assess their players, and what are the potential tripwires. Now, to give some positive projection, I think there is a world where the backline clicks instantly, because I think they're just from personality, I think Kodak and Massa could work very well. Pokpo and Daku do work very well. We know that, you know, what you need in Overwatch, historically at least, are very strong front lines and back lines, and the DPS then can be supportive. Now, the problem in that regard is, is that I would like Pokpo to be a bit, a bit more of an aggressive beast Winston, for instance, or, you know, Reinhardt. That is not something we've seen too much of from him. So... Keep that in mind, though. The weakness for me, the likely weakness, will come from the DPS role. 
But even there, they have amazing potential. If Erster and Defran get it together, that is potentially a highly explosive DPS rank, um, lane that could mesmerize in the coming Overwatch League season. And that also, perhaps more importantly to you, promise very exciting Overwatch. Thanks for listening.